Hello, I'm Kate Johnson. We are continuing our read of A Spiritual Authority by Watchman Nee. We are now on chapter six. You can go to our previous videos to view chap uh, here, chapter four and five. We didn't do chapters uh, one through three because they were already done by others. So you can tune into them if you wanted to hear those chapters, but we'll be continuing to the end, God willing. Okay, chapter six, let's read. How God establishes his kingdom. Though he was a son, yet learned obedience by the things which he suffered, and having been made perfect, he became unto all them that obey him, the author of eternal salvation. Hebrews 5, 8 through 11, 8 through 9. And we are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God hath given to them that obey him. Acts 5, 32. But they have not all obeyed the glad tidings. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? Romans ten, sixteen, Rendering vengeance to them that know not God, and to them that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus. 2 Thessalonians 1, 8. Seeing we have purified our, your souls in your obedience, to the truth unto unfeigned love of the brethren. Love one another from the heart fervently. First Peter 1 Peter 1.22 The Lord learned obedience through suffering. As God secured the principle of obedience through the life of our Lord, so God all establishes, also establishes his authority through the Lord. Now let us see how God today establishes his kingdom on the basis of that authority. The Lord came to this world empty-handed. He did not bring obedience with him. He learned obedience through what he suffered and thus became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. But by going through suffering after suffering, he learned to be obedient unto death, even death on a cross. When the Lord came forth from the Godhead to become man, he truly became a man, weak and acquainted with suffering. Every suffering he bore ripened into a fruit of obedience. No suffering of any kind was able to stir him to murmuring or fretfulness. How different from this are the many Christians who fail to learn obedience even after many years. Although their suffering increases, their obedience does not. When suffering comes, they often murmur with anguish, indicating again that they have not yet learned obedience. But as our Lord passed through the all kinds of sufferings, he continually exhibited the spirit of obedience. And so he has become the source of our eternal salvation. By the obedience of one man, many have received grace. Our Lord's obedience is for the sake of the kingdom of God's kingdom. The aim of redemption is to further the kingdom of God. God will establish his kingdom. Have you noticed how greatly the fall of the angels and of man has affected the universe and what a great problem it, is, it has created for God? It was God's intention that the beings he created should accept his authority. Yet both kinds of created beings rejected it. God could not establish his authority in the created beings. Even so, he would not withdraw it. He might withdraw his presence, but he will never give up the authority he has initiated. When his authority, where his authority is, there is his rightful place. Hence, God, on the other hand, will affirm his authority and on the other hand will establish his kingdom. Though Satan continually violates God's authority and men daily rebel against him, God will not permit such rebellion to continue forever. He will set up his kingdom. Why does the Bible call God's kingdom the kingdom of, he of the heavens? Because the rebellion has not been restricted simply to this earth, but has in addition reached to the heavens where the angels rebelled. How then does the Lord establish God's kingdom? He establishes it through his obedience. Never once was he disobedient to God. Never once did he resist God's authority while he was on the earth. 
By obeying perfectly and by permitting God's authority to rule absolutely, he established God's kingdom within the realm of his own obedience. Now, just as our Lord has done so much, so must the church today obey in order that the authority of God may prosper and the kingdom of God be manifested. God ordains the church to be the vanguard of his kingdom. After the fall of Adam, God chose Noah and his family. However, they too fell after the flood. So God called out Abraham to be the father of a multitude of nations, his intention being to be set up his kingdom through Abraham. Abraham was succeeded by the election of Isaac and then later, later of Jacob. The descendants of Jacob multiplied greatly under the Egyptian oppression, and therefore God sent Moses to deliver them out of Egypt, that they might establish a new nation. But because they were disobedient ones among them, God led the Israelites through the wilderness in order to teach them obedience. Nevertheless, they persisted in their rebellion against God, with the result that the whole generation fell dead on the way. Even though the second generation succeeded in entering Canaan, they still did not hearken to the Lord's word with a perfect heart. Hence, they could not drive the Canaanites completely out of the land. Saul became the first king, but due to his rebellion, the kingdom could not be established. It was not until David was chosen that God found in him the king who was after his own heart. For David fully obeyed the authority of God. Even so, traces of rebellion still remained within the nation. God had appointed Jerusalem to be the place where his name would be set. But the people continued to sacrifice at the great high place in Gibeon. They were weak in obedience. They had a king, yet, lacked, yet they lacked the spiritual substance of a kingdom. Before the time of David, there was a kingdom without a proper king. At David's time, both the king and the kingdom were present, but the spiritual substance of the latter was still missing. God's kingdom had truly been established. The Lord came to this world to set up God's kingdom. His gospel is twofold in nature, the personal and the corporate. As to the personal, the gospel calls men to receive eternal life through faith, as to the corporate, it bids men to enter God's kingdom through repentance. God's eyes are upon the kingdom. The so-called Lord's Prayer, for example, begins and concludes with the kingdom. It starts with, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in earth, so on, as in heaven, so on earth. God's kingdom is that realm within which the will of God is carried out without any interference. The prayer ends with, Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Matthew six thirteen. The kingdom and the power and the glory are interrelated. Now is come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our Lord and the authority of his Christ, proclaims Revelation twelve ten. This is because the kingdom is the scope of authority. For lo, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you, says the Lord. Luke 17, 21. In the midst of you, not within you, the Lord himself is actually the kingdom of God. When the Lord Jesus is among you, the kingdom of God is in your midst. This is because God's authority is completely carried out in his life. Now, just as the kingdom of God is in the Lord, so it is to be found in the church because the Lord's life is released to the church. And so God's kingdom extends also to the church. Beginning with Noah, God managed to get a kingdom, but it was earthly and not God's kingdom. God's kingdom actually begins with the Lord Jesus. How small was its scope at the outset? Today, though, this grain of wheat has borne much fruit. Its scope embraces not only the Lord, but many saints as well. God purposes that we be his kingdom and his church. Since 
the church is ordained to be the spear within God's authority is exercised. He wishes to have his rightful, rightful place in more than just a few individuals. He desires the whole church to give him absolute pre preeminence in order that his authority may prevail and there be no rebellion. Thus will God set up his authority in the midst of his created beings. He wants us to be obedient, not only to the direct authority, which he himself exercises, but also to the delegated authorities whom he sets up. What he expects is full obedience, not a partial one. God calls people not only to believe, but also to obey. The Bible mentions obedience as well as faith. We are not only sinners, but additionally sons of disobedience. What Romans 10, 16 means by believes our report in Isaiah 53 and 1 is obeyed the glad tidings. The nature of believing the gospel is obeying it, rendering vengeance to them that know not God and to them that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus, 2 Thessalonians 1 and 8. Those who do not obey are the rebellious. Unto them that are factuous and obey not the truth shall be wrath and indignation, Romans 2 and 8. The disobedient are the rebellious ones, seeing we have purified your souls in your obedience to the truth, 1 Peter 1, 22. This clearly indicates that purification is by obedience to the truth. Faith is obedience. Believers would best be called obeyers, for they are to be subject to the authority of the Lord, as well as to believe in him. After Paul had been enlightened, he asked, What shall I do, Lord? Acts 22 and 10. He not only believed, he in addition submitted to the Lord. His repentance was caused both by understanding grace and by obedience to authority. When he was moved by the Holy Spirit to see the authority of the gospel, he addressed Jesus as Lord. God calls us not only to receive his life through faith, but also to maintain his authority through obedience. He counsels us who are in the church to obey the authorities he has established in home, school, society, and church, as well as to obey his direct authority. It is not necessary to point out specifically which person you should obey. It simply means that whenever you encounter God's authority, directly or indirectly, you should learn obedience. Many are able to hearken to and obey only a certain person. This shows that they have not seen authority. It is vain to obey man. It is authority that we must obey. To those who know authority, even a slight disobedience will make him feel, make them feel that they have been rebellious. But those who have not seen authority have no idea how rebellious they are. Before they before being enlightened, Paul kicked against the goads without realize, realizing what he was doing. After enlightenment, however, the first thing which happens is that the eyes of Paul are open to see authority, and this thing continues to increase thereafter. Though Paul met only a little brother by the name of Ananias, he never questioned what kind of man Ananias was, whether learned or illiterate, because he was not looking at man. Paul recognized that Ananias was sent by God, and he accordingly subjected himself to that delegated authority. How easy it is to obey one after one has learned authority. Through the church, the nations to become God's kingdom. If the church refuses to accept God's authority, God has no way to establish his kingdom. God's way of obtaining his kingdom is first in the Lord Jesus, then in the church, and lastly in the whole world. One day a proclamation will go out, announcing that the kingdom of the world is become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. Revelation 11.15 
The church occupies the place between the kingdom found in the person of the Lord Jesus and the further extension of that kingdom to be found when the world becomes the kingdom of the Lord and of his Christ. The kingdom must be found in the Lord Jesus before it can be established in the church. It needs to be implanted in the church before it can be secured among the nations. There can be no church without the Lord Jesus, and there can be no further extension of God's kingdom without the church. While on earth, the Lord obeyed in even very minor matters. For example, he paid the tax, the temple tax. Having no money, he obtained the shekel from the mouth of a fish. Again, when he asked on another occasion about paying civil taxes, he affirmed, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. Matthew 22 and 21. Although Caesar was a rebellious person, he was nonetheless set up by God. Consequently, he must be obeyed. After we have fully obeyed, our Lord will then rise up and deal with those who disobey. Through our obedience, the kingdom shall be exalted to the whole earth. Today, though many are sensitive to the sin, to sin, yet not to rebellion, men ought to have a sense of for authority as well as a sense of sin. To be deficient in sensing sin deprives one from living as a Christian. To lack in sensing authority disqualifies him as an obeyer. The church must obey God's authority. We must know how to obey in the church. There is no authority within the church which does not require obedience. God intends to have his authority fully manifested in the church and to have his kingdom ex extended through the church. After the church has fully obeyed, the entire earth shall be brought under the authority of God. Should the church fail to let God's authority prevail within it, God's kingdom will be thwarted from covering the whole earth. The church is therefore the way to the kingdom, but it can equally be the frustration to the kingdom. How can God's kingdom be manifested if we are not able to be subject to a little hardship in the church? How can God's kingdom prevail if we always reason and argue among ourselves? We have greatly delayed God's time. All rebellion must be eradicated so that God's way may not be blocked. Once the church has truly obeyed, all nations will follow suit. The responsibility on the church is immense. When the will and command of God find free passage in the church, his kingdom shall surely come. That concludes our reading of chapter 6 of Spiritual Authority by Watchman Nee. I hope you're being blessed by this reading. Um, please uh, don't forget to click the subscribe button. We're going to be going on to chapter 7 and we're going to be doing further readings on uh, spiritual matters in the future. Also, please click the like button. Amen. We like likes. Amen. So please do so and tell your friends we're reading Spiritual Authority by Watchman Nee and we'll see you in chapter 7.